Good morning and welcome to Rising, a truly extraordinary show today. And it even says that in the teleprompter, so it must be true. Truly extraordinary. And we all know that we will li read literally whatever is in the That's right. teleprompter. Just That's tell what to say and I say it. That's how it goes. It's Ron Burgundy. Alimi Aluren and Rachel Bovard will join us to discuss the confirmation hearings of Judge Kentanji Brown-Jackson. But right now we want to go over new reports from Ukrainian intelligence, which reveal that Russian elites are plotting to overthrow Russian President Vladimir Putin in order to restore economic security in the country. The Kyiv Independent said in a tweet that Alexander Bordnikov, head of FSB security agency, is allegedly being considered as Putin's successor. Take that with a huge grain of salt. Massive grain. <laughs> yes. According to the first, the first casualty of war is truth. And yeah. yeah. So we don't know if that's propaganda or if that's actually yeah. reflects real I'm sure real people would like it to be true, but we don't. Right. We don't, we know. don't know. But that's what they're saying. Anyway, so uh, the, chief, the chief director of intelligence of Ukraine said, quote, it is known that Bortnikov and some other influential representatives of the Russian elite are considering various options to remove Putin from power. In particular, poisoning, sudden disease, or any other, quote, coincidence is not excluded, unquote. According to the Daily Beast, Putin is so paranoid of being poisoned, he has people tasting his food before he eats it and replace his entire personal staff of a thousand workers. Now, like I said, take that with a grain of salt. Actually, have somebody else taste those grains of salt <laughs> before you take them. Here with us to discuss is investigative reporter at The Intercept, Ken Klippenstein. Ken, what do you make of these reports? Well, like you said, take it with a grain of salt. When I talk to folks in the military intelligence community, they themselves take their own intelligence with a grain of salt in the sense that um, there needs to be a scientific process if you're going to take intelligence seriously. Uh, they say that uh, the, pro the process by which they come up with national intelligence estimates, it's kind of like science. You have every agency debate it and question things. And unfortunately, in these kind of reports, uh, that doesn't that doesn't always happen. So so one never knows. The, the intelligence, our U.S. intelligence at least, has I think there's a perception, probably correct, that well, you tell me if it's correct, that our intelligence surrounding, you know, what Russia's doing in Ukraine has been better or more accurate than uh, than what we were accustomed to with some of the stuff going on in the Middle East. Uh, can you speak to that? Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, um, what they said uh, came to pass that uh, Putin was going to invade, and they were warning about this as early, I believe, as January. And I know that. Um, there were uh, military contingencies called preparing the battle space, um, you know, uh, backing the Ukrainians going back as, as as late as November at the very least. So they did seem to be on top of the ball. And that's important to the Biden administration because I think they're trying to, um, uh, you know, portray a different uh, image after after what happened in Afghanistan. And is that is that simply because they were built to understand the Soviet Union. I mean, although on the other hand, they completely missed the collapse of the Soviet Union. So they, they blew that, but they were set up, you know, the U.S. intelligence industry is set up, you know, to combat Russia. So is, is that why they got better at this? How did they figure this out, but they couldn't see the Berlin Wall coming down? Yeah, so what's unique about this conflict um, in, in terms of conflicts that have taken place in the last 30 years or so is that this is with a nation state. And as you say, we've had a lot of experience, a lot of practice monitoring nation states. And just in general, it's easier to know um, where to look to collect intelligence because there's a bureaucracy, there's a formal system. On the other hand, if you look at the post 9-11 conflicts, you have uh, non-state actors like Al Qaeda and ISIS. Those are a lot harder to keep tabs on because they don't follow the same organizational structure that uh, typical nation states do. Believers of the New World Order conspiracy theory received new fuel for fodder after President Biden spoke about the United States' response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine during an address at Business Roundtable's CEO quarterly meeting. Let's listen. You know, we are at an inflection point, I believe, in the world economy. Not just the world economy, in the world. It occurs every three or four generations. As one of, them, as the, uh, one of the top military people said to me in a secure meeting the other day, 60, 60 million people died between 1900 and 1946. And uh, since then, we established a liberal world order, and that hadn't happened in a long while. A lot of people died, but nowhere near the chaos. And now is a time when things are shifting. We're going to there's going to be a new world order out there, and we've got to lead it. And we've got to unite the rest of the free world in doing it. So anyway, is Biden just so clueless, I guess, that he doesn't realize what that 
phrasing implies to some people? Or why, why would he why would he put it that way? I guess. I'm guessing he's not an Alex Jones regular, and maybe right. he doesn't know the ter- terminology <laughs> about what that what that means. But what what this is is it's returning us um, to a pre 1990s kind of state of affairs where where there are you know there is superpower competition in a way that I don't think we had seen since the collapse of the Soviet Union. I mean this this kind of um, diction harkens back to the language that they used at that time. So um, not only are we seeing the rise of China. Um, but uh, as Russia reasserts itself, we're really, uh, it, again, it feels like we're sort of setting the clock back <laughs> in, in, in terms of the, the, the way that we conceptualize uh, global competition and conflict. And, and that's what I thought that that, uh, that terminology reminds me of. And, and so, Ken, we, we discussed reports earlier that the heads of Saudi Arabia and the UAE had kind of denied calls from Biden, reporting from the Wall Street Journal as the, as the U.S. was working to build international support around Ukraine and also pushing for uh, more oil production. So, uh, so, but still, the U.S. continues to fill orders for the Persian Gulf. The uh, Wall Street Journal reports that Biden has transferred a significant number of Patriot anti-missile interceptors uh, to Saudi Arabia within the last month. So what do you, what do you make of the, these, these various reports and what's the latest on the, the relationship between the U.S. and the UAE and Saudi Arabia? Yeah, what's fascinating about this is that this has not happened in isolation. This is a continuation of a trend. Um, last year, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin uh, had planned a trip to uh, Saudi Arabia, and they ended up canceling at the last 24 hours, which if you talk to folks in the diplomatic community, <laughs> that is a huge hoisting of the uh, middle digit <laughs> in, in, in the diplomatic world to cancel at the last minute like that because it doesn't give them time for you know logistics and to plan different things. You can cancel well ahead of time. And so um, this is a continuation of... That, and I think um, talking to folks both uh, in the administration and the intelligence community, an indication of the acrimonious nature of, of this relationship um, that is uh, that is anger on the part of Saudi Arabia and uh, UAE at President Biden. If you look at um, his predecessor, they were much closer to President Trump, who took his first foreign visit to Riyadh, um, sold a record number of arms to uh, Saudi Arabia defended MBS after um, the CIA concluded that he had ordered the assassination of uh, Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi. And now we have a Democrat in office who uh, is called Saudi a pariah and declines to meet with MBS. So I think it's pretty clear why that tension exists. And it's playing out in things like this, where they're refusing to meet with uh, high level U.S. officials. Yeah. And, and is there going to be do you think it's just going to keep moving in that direction? Are we like past the point when maybe it's a maybe it's a good thing. Maybe we don't want to fix this relationship with this brutal, murderous regime. But of course, now it's 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 a issue because of gas prices. And we you know, we want to be focused on Russia, Ukraine and, and, and you know, not be not be having this feud uh, with we can't afford to have a feud with every other country on the, on the face of the earth. Yeah, unfortunately, I think that we're really limited in how much we can extricate ourselves from this relationship because of that um, uh, fossil fuel economy that exists. The reality, uh, I think it would help a whole lot if they were able to reinstate the JCPOA with Iran. Um, Estimates hold that it would increase the global oil supply by something like 10 percent. Same with Venezuela. And if they're able to ramp up their production in the long term, that would increase as well. But um, none of this uh, quite replaces the unique, uh, not just supply that Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates enjoy, but the capacity they have to flood the market immediately that those two other states do not. And I think that, um, you know, a few drinks in and in talks with uh, U.S. officials, they acknowledge that and say there's serious limits to, um, you know, this human rights based, order based um, global system that the U.S. leaders are always gassing on about um, when we have not had the policy um, to allow us to do that and to and to uh, uh, extricate ourselves from relationship with, uh, you, you know, frankly, uh, dictatorial regimes like Saudi and the UAE. And how how seriously is the national security state taking the, taking this relationship with Saudi Arabia? And are are they finally are, are they finally saying you know what our entire Middle East strategy over the last seventy years has run its course and we need to you know we need to we need full energy independence and that means clean energy. Or are they saying no? We just we just need a different you know tactical approach to the region, and and we can kind of we can get our mojo back there. My understanding is that in the National Security Council, there's a lot of tension uh, between uh, you know a lot of the Biden administration appointees and Brett McGurk in particular, who uh, was I'm told was chosen to kind of 
tell the other side, <laughs> the, the subtext being telling the non-human rights side, telling just the, you know, raw real politic, um, you know, what are, what, what are, what are the, what are the naked interests at play? And for whatever reason, Biden has tended to side with, uh, his perception of things, uh, you know, much to the chagrin of other people in the administration. And, you know, when you, when you, when you talk to folks about this, I think there's appreciation, not publicly, cause they can't go out and say these things and criticize the president, but privately, I think there's a lot of, um, disappointment and, and, uh, uh, cognizance of this tension between the sort of soaring rhetoric about our concern for for rights that we're seeing, you know, events with respect to Ukraine, and then the reality of working with these uh, dictatorial regimes that, um, you know, are disappearing activists, behead people, just executed dozens of people a couple of weeks ago, you know, the ugly reality that um, MBS has not um, embodied the ref kind of reform that uh, a lot of national media tried to claim that he would when he first came into power. The, the Iran nuclear deal is also up in the air as lawmakers in both parties tell the Hill they feel in the dark on the legislation set up by Biden. There are also doubts on the timing of negotiations as relations with China and Russia, two signatories to the original Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, are at an all-time low, and there are concerns a new deal could funnel millions to Russia as it would allow Putin to do nuclear energy business with Iran. So the timing of this is all very interesting. Obviously, we, we the Biden administration really wanted to get you know back on track. This was an important Obama administration thing that you know, Trump pulled out of, and there's understandable reticence, I think, from the Iranians to well, how could you just leave this deal again? But talk a little bit about you know how the how the timing of these negotiations, how it matters given you know, what's going on with Russia. Yeah, so we have gas prices at a seven-year high. Um, that is going to have a domestic effect uh, in the United States as we uh, move into midterm elections. The president was considering gas cards. He's done all sorts of things to indicate, I think, desperation on the part of the administration, tapping the strategic oil reserve, trying to come up with different solutions to this. Um, because, you know, when when you've uh, sanctioned the Russian oil supply, which is understandable, you want to punish Putin, um, that has the effect of continuing to drive things up. And so he's really in a tight spot. If you look at the relationship um, between Russian leadership and UAE and Saudi leadership, they're aware of this. They're taking calls from him, and, and it seems like making overtures uh, to send a message to the U.S. that if you don't treat us better and let us do what we want uh, with regard to human rights, with regard to um, Yemen, you know, we might, uh, we're, I had a story about this recently, um, MBS's relationship with um, uh, Russian President Putin goes back to at least 2015 when he took a meeting with him because Obama declined to meet with him. So um, there's sort of this zero sum game, or at least that's the image they're trying to uh, project um, between, you know, the U.S. stepping back and then other nations like China and Russia uh, moving in to fill that vacuum and, and have a relationship with them. So I think the most interesting part of this is, uh, go back to the new world order phraseology, we're looking at a new new world order here where, um, I mean, when have you ever heard a president talk about not just uh, reinstating relations with Iran, but with Venezuela too. I'm in touch with um, the registered lobbyist of the Venezuelans. He's a um, he was a former Republican congressman. Uh, this is this is extremely unusual. And when you talk to him, uh, you know he articulates, I think, a persuasive case for um, wh why we could normalize relations and, and help alleviate the oil situation. But to hear this from a uh, you know career lifetime Republican. It's almost like you're in Alice in Wonderland. It's so bizarre. And I, I think that it's reflective of the um, recognition that things have to change, that this state of play where you give all of this leverage to uh, the, the Persian Gulf states because of our um, refusal to move away from fossil fuels is not a, is not a tenable situation. And also reflective of what a former lawmaker will do for money. <laughs> Ken, Ken, thanks so much uh, for joining us. I'll see you later today. Great to be with you guys. And we'll tell you what's on our radars up next.